Good morning and welcome to Erskine Presbyterian Church. Good morning and welcome to our traditional Good Friday service. A few times a year we want to celebrate some high and holy seasons in the Christian calendar in a unique way, in a traditional way. We're so glad that you've decided to join us and worship with us this morning. Today we're going to be doing a few things we don't normally do at Erskine Church. We're going to have a responsive reading early in the service. Our music provided to us by Sean and Nikki is just absolutely wonderful. Again, it is a little more on the traditional side. So we hope that you enjoy. We hope that this is a time of reflection and contemplation for you. We have here as a visual demonstration candles representing the life of Christ, the life that was extinguished this day so many years ago. To prepare us for worship, we are going to enter into a responsive reading that is based on Isaiah 53. In fact, most of our service today will draw from the scriptures and themes that come from the prophet Isaiah. Let us read. I will read the part that says, Minister, you are the people. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took upon him our infirmity, infirmities and carried his sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Whom did he suffer for? He was pierced for our transgressions. Whom did he die for? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that has brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before our shears are silent, is silent, so he did not open his mouth. For he bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you, Nikki. After each song, we are going to return to the prophet Isaiah and pair a reading from Isaiah to the gospel. Our first reading is Isaiah and then Matthew. He grew up like a small plant before the Lord, 
like a root growing in a dry land. And he had no special beauty or form to make us notice him. There was nothing in his appearance to make us desire him. And he was hated and rejected by people. He had much pain and suffering. People would not even look at him. He was hated and they didn't even notice him. That evening, a rich man named Joseph, a follower of Jesus from the town of Arimathea, came to Jerusalem. Joseph went to Pilate and asked to have Jesus' body. So Pilate gave orders for the soldiers to give it to Joseph. Then Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. He put Jesus' body in a new tomb that he had cut out of a wall of rock and rolled a very large stone to block the entrance of the tomb. Then Joseph went away. Mary Magdalene and the other woman named Mary were there, sitting near the tomb. Our next scripture reading pairs Isaiah with the Gospel of Mark. But he took our suffering on him and felt our pain for us. We saw his suffering and thought God was punishing him. We all have wandered away like sheep. Each of us has gone his own way, but the Lord has put on him the punishment for the evil we have done. But it was the Lord who decided to crush him and make him suffer. Jesus and his followers went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I pray. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be very sad and troubled. He said to them, my heart is full of sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch. After walking a little further, 
away from them. Jesus fell to the ground and prayed, if possible, he would not have this time of suffering. He prayed, Abba, Father, you can do all things. Take away this cup of suffering, but do what you want, not what I want. Let us return to the scriptures once more. But he was wounded for the wrong we did. He was crushed for the evil that we had done. The punishment which made us well was given to him. And we are healed because of his wounds. The soldiers took Jesus to the governor's palace. And the other soldiers were there together, and they put a purple robe on Jesus and used thorny branches to make him a crown for his head. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! The soldiers beat Jesus on the head many times with a stick. They spit on him and made fun of him by bowing on their knees and worshiping him. After they finished, the soldiers took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes once again. Then they led him out of the palace to be crucified.
Let us continue to read through the scriptures as we pair Isaiah with the Gospel of Luke. He was beaten down and punished, but he didn't say a word. He was like a lamb being led to be killed. He was quiet as a sheep is quiet while the wool is being cut. He never opened his mouth. They said that the Christ must suffer these things before entering into his glory. Then starting with Moses and all the prophets had said about him, Jesus began to explain everything that had been written about him in the scriptures.
We have one more paired scripture reading this morning, Isaiah and the Gospel of John. Men took him away roughly and unfairly. He died without children to continue his family. He was put to death. He was punished for the sins of my people. He was buried with the wicked, and he died with the rich. He had done nothing wrong, and he had never lied. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take the body of Jesus. Joseph was a secret follower of Jesus because he was afraid of some of the leaders. So Pilate gave him permission, so Joseph came and took Jesus' body away. Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus at night, went to, with Joseph. He brought about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. These two men took Jesus' body and wrapped it with the spices and pieces of linen cloth, which is how they bury the dead. In the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and the garden was a new tomb that had never been used before. I have some borrowed words from the scholar Raymond Ortlin intermingled with my own that I would like to share. The scenes of Good Friday as portrayed and foretold by Isaiah are as vivid as they are brutal. They paint the picture of a man rejected by his peers, scorned by the ones he had come to teach and save, and seemingly abandoned by God. I'm not sure if you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, but if you did, you witnessed on scenes images of a man who endured sure agony and pain inflicted upon him by those who were all too happy to see him crushed. On Good Friday, we tend to focus a considerable amount on the violence which was done that day, and while there's nothing wrong with that, it would be wrong to simply leave these scriptures hanging in the air without surrounding them with the proper context. Isaiah does not drop this chapter of inhuman treatment in our laps and walk away. He provides us with a fuller picture so that we can accept and understand the divine strategy which is at play. 
So let us once more, one final time, return to Isaiah for the final verses of this chapter. But it was the Lord who decided to crush him and make him suffer. The Lord made his life a penalty offering. But he will still see his descendants and live a long life. He will complete the things the Lord wanted him to do. After his soul suffers many things, he will see and be satisfied. My servant will make many people right with God. He will carry away their sins. For this reason, I will make him a great man among people, and he will share in all things with those who are strong. He willingly gave his life and was treated like a criminal, but he carried away the sins of many people and asked forgiveness for those who had sinned. This here at the end of the chapter provides the fullest picture of what happened that Good Friday so long ago. We can see that the death of Jesus wasn't more, was more than just a human plot. It was divine strategy at work. On the cross, Jesus was doing the will of the Lord. And he wasn't embittered by it. He didn't hang from the cross screaming curses at his tormentors the other way the other victims did. Nor did he blaspheme God. He perceived his torments as the saving will of the Lord. This is what makes the cross a mystery. It's on that instrument of human cruelty that Jesus made his soul an offering to God for other people's sin. The cross, therefore, wasn't defeat. It was not Jesus' downfall. It was the mechanism of making the will of God prosper in the most improbable way imaginable. And that is a good thing for us to, un- us to understand and let sit with us in the pain of this day. Let those two things intermingle. The strategy of God may unfold in our lives or in the life of our church in improbable ways. Simply because something is hard or difficult to comprehend does not mean that God is not fully alive or at work. I want you to hear that message this morning. We know that the cross of Christ achieved the ancient purpose of God with victorious love. That is the fullness, the broadness, the wideness of the story, the picture of Good Friday. So Jesus, kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking at God's saving plan, he measures the price he had to pay for its success. How does he feel? Many have commented in recent years that God's plan of sending Jesus to die was considered or should be considered a cosmic child abuse, that God very roughly and wrongly treated his son this day. I would say we should allow Jesus to speak to this, because in verse 11 it says, after his soul suffers many things, he will see and be satisfied. An ancient Isaiah scroll inserts an interpretive word here saying he shall see light and be satisfied. We know that that anguish was not his final emotional experience. His anguish led to the dawning light of victorious joy. Looking at what he accomplished by his suffering, Jesus is satisfied. Have you ever experienced or accomplished something incredibly hard in your life, a difficult task, but and then afterwards have looked back and had great satisfaction on what you had done. That, that is how Christ views Good Friday. Even at the cost of great suffering, there is satisfaction because the light of salvation is dawning on those who look to him. Jesus takes no greater pleasure than clearing guilty names of sinners, even though it demands that he bear their iniquities upon himself. And he is not alone. The Bible says that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over just one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 10. Despite that this is the plan of the Lord and this passage celebrates Jesus' victory, we find ourselves, by the graciousness of God, painted into this picture. We have a portion here. First, Isaiah comments that he, Jesus, will see his descendants. That's verse 10, which is very strange because I didn't think Jesus had any children. Excuse me. 
That was simply part of the tragedy of a life cut so short. One does not leave the next generation to hold the memories or continue the legacy of the previous. And this would indeed be true except that we are his offspring. We are his descendants. John 1.12 says, Yet to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There are today roughly two billion people around the world who call themselves Christians, whom Jesus has given the right to become children of God. That's two billion descendants who carry on the memories, the life, the teaching, the wisdom of Jesus, and two billion people who are actively continuing and contributing to the legacy of Jesus. That is incredible. The scriptures, they continue to draw us in, they continue to include us in this divine strategy as Isaiah, he takes hold of a military metaphor of taking spoils or plunders when he says, he, Jesus, shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now, the people who executed Jesus didn't believe that he had anything of great value to share. In fact, they literally stripped him of everything that he had and then rolled dice to see who would get what. And this goes to show how easily, so excuse me, this goes to show how easy it is to entirely miss the strategy of God. Remember when Jesus sat on that mountain back in Matthew chapter 5 and said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not the powerful, not those who are in charge, not the rich. After his resurrection, Jesus says to his churches, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations, just as I have received authority from my Father. That's Revelation 2. All of the nations belong to God or under the rule of God. Many are in rebellion today, but to his children God is going to allow us to rule over the world when he comes to establish his kingdom because the meek shall inherit the earth through Christ. And so the cross is not some dreamy religious idea. The cross is power. It is working. The one who descended to unimaginable depths is now enjoying the spoils of complete victory. He is achieving, he is achievably saving guilty people today. He treats transgressors as his friends and shares his victory with his former enemies. He stands before the Father making intercession for the very ones who drove him to death. His cross is power that evil can't comprehend, can't even conquer. But to God, it is everything. Nothing will ever rob Christ of his hard-won right to justify us, those who are both once ungodly, but now are children of God. For who else would willingly serve as your scapegoat? Who else can love you so miraculously? Who else but Jesus, our Savior, will go to such lengths to welcome us into God's loving arms and share with us the bounty of his victory? Thanks be to our Lord for the depths of his sorrow, the endurance of his obedience, and the strength of his love. Amen. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, Tremble, tremble, were you there?